It's good to see the presence of everyone. We have some who are visiting with us. We thank you for being here. Hope that you'll come back. Hope that everyone will take your Bible and follow it very closely and listen to it as it is, in fact, the Word of God. As you can see on the screen, we'll be basing the text this evening from 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we'll basically be staying there. Chapter 6, verse 10. Of course, with all the things that we have been seeing in our country, it is a a scary time. And it's not because uh, things are all that different than it was in the first century. It's the fact that our, our country has declined in its respect for the Word of God. We've seen changes that have taken place in our country that changes perspectives and changes everything. Changes how we will be looking at our country. But it really goes back to the same basic philosophy that has gradually started developing and taking root in this country as it was in all empires of men. All kingdoms of men think along the same line. They do not think in terms of there's a creator and the creator has revealed his word and we need to do that. What they think in terms of that we're here by accident, we get to make the rules like we want to. And, and so they operate from that standpoint, not from the standpoint of revelation from a creator. Now, it's taken a while for our, our leaders in our country to decline from that stand that they have taken in the past. And that's what disturbs us because we see that as our country keeps drifting further and further from the divine standard, it means then that they will also do the things that, that bring about persecution to those who do stand for God's word. Further we drift from the Jerusalem gospel, the closer our standards become to that of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we see what, nations to, uh, what happens to nations There was once a prophet came out of Israel and he went to the nation of Nineveh. And and his message was that they needed to turn that nation around and think about the creator that they are all responsible for. That creator being God. And Jonah preached to that nation of people and the leadership from the leadership on down, that whole nation turned around, which is a good note except that it didn't last all that long. After they did repent, it wasn't long until that nation went back to the old ways, old ways of thinking, and then later on, Nineveh, that great nation of Assyria, uh, did fall. When Jesus was here, he did not look at the politics of his day and think in terms of what a mess this is in the Roman Empire, it was already a mess. It was already based on a mess. It was a, it was a thought process that was messy to start with. It was a philosophy that there is no absolute truth. And so when Jesus stood before Pilate, Pilate uh, said, what is truth? As if to say that as far as I'm concerned, you can say there is truth all you want to, but I don't believe there is absolute truth is what Pilate was telling Jesus. Of course, Jesus said uh, there is absolute truth. One of those absolute truths is is my kingdom is not of this world, and so it's not intertwined. It really doesn't depend on what the nations of this world do. As far as Jesus is concerned, his kingdom will stand when kingdoms of men fall, because his is an eternal kingdom. Now, although we are greatly concerned because we see the handwriting on the wall as far as nations come and go, the patterns are all there, and it looks like that we're going in the, our nation is going in a corrupt way, in a way that's same as the Roman Empire, that we don't recognize any absolute truth, and we won't recognize Jesus as King of Kings, and so therefore they're going to go in that direction, and there's really a whole, not a whole lot that we can do to stop it unless we can do a better job 
at spreading the gospel of Christ and changing hearts from the inside. And that's really what the Lord wants us to do anyway. Our salvation is not dependent upon human governments at all. Never has been and never will be. And so the the power of the gospel is that it is the truth. And it is the truth of God. And if we can spread that into the community and into the hearts and lives of people, then those people will see truth and come to that truth regardless of the nation around them. I have to keep my passion and my moral frustration intact. I have to be able to take hold of the realization that kingdoms of men come and they go. They, they rise and they fall. That's been the nature of them from the from the beginning, and it will be no different in regard to this one. Now, we could wish that we could go back to some greater respect from the leadership down, but the kingdom of God does not depend on that. And our lives are locked into a greater court, a greater and a supreme even greater than the kingdoms that we are occupying physically. I have to keep my frustrations, and you do too. We all have to keep our frustrations under the power of God, always recognizing that there is a greater power at work here, and that everything, our happiness and our future is locked in something much greater than the direction that that a country will take. Now, as we've watched this debauchery and sin eat away at our country, we've got to remember some things. And so that's why I'm taking you back to this Roman culture, this culture that Timothy and Paul were a part of, and some things that Paul wanted Timothy and consequently the rest of us. Some things that he wanted uh, Timothy and all Christians to remember. And so let's begin reading in verse 10 some of those reminders. Verse 10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Materialism, money, love of what money buys, and the power of money, all of that is something that roots and roots us into some things that that will involve us in some evil if that's, where, if that's what we love, if that's where our heart is. And he says, because of that love for the material, and that's our first point, is don't get caught up in materialism, whether it be the money aspect, and really money is doled out to us by temporal governments. Don't get wrapped up in the material aspects of this world. I know we've got to have a certain amount to to live and get by. But don't let that be where your heart is. Because if that's where your heart is, it will rip your heart to pieces to see what's going on. So he says, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith. They were the faith should have been in first place, and that should have been the thing that we loved the most. But then our the love of money started pulling at our heartstrings and pulling us away from the faith. They strayed. These are Christians who have strayed from the faith in their greediness. They had the faith at one time, but they lost sight of what that faith entailed and what was involved in it. And he says they therefore got wrapped up in the material things and strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So we got to be, number one, among the things that we've got to remember in this material world and in the kingdom of this nation, this physical nation that we're a part of, is that we must remember not to let, to get so caught up in materialism that it robs us. 
What it can do is it can drive us closer to the faith and become more involved in the faith than maybe we've done in the past. Or we can use it to let it drag us from the faith. But it's really up to us. Individually, we have the power to decide if we're going to love the material things, the physical things, and the things that have to do with a physical nation. Or we're going to look back and say... But just remember, every kingdom of men has come and they've gone. But the kingdom of heaven, that's what lasts forever. Many people have been uh, ruined by this. And many Christians have been pulled away because they got so involved in the material aspects of living this life that it ruined their faith it ruined their relationship with God. It, it pulled them away from God. We must not get caught up in material things. Unfortunately, it's all that a lot of people see. Do you expect people of the world to know the same thing you know about God and Jesus and the Bible? They don't know that. All that most people grow up in in our society is a materialistic society and they're looking at how things affect them monetarily. Not thinking about, well, I've got a soul and I'm, I'm accountable to a creator. They're not thinking along that. All that some people see are the material things. So don't get caught up in it. Don't let what most people see be all that you see. You must make sure you see something else. Something that people of the world can't see or don't see. In verse 6 through 8, he says, Godliness with contentment. Now, that's something. Make sure that you see the value of godliness because the people of the world, they don't have a clue about that. But make sure you do. You must make sure you see the value of godliness and the value of being content. Don't let people of the world and don't let things of the world pull you into various hurtful loss. Things that drown you in misery. Learn that there's something higher than that. There's something greater than that. Godliness is great gain. If you if you don't have all the material things that you would like to have, don't let that rob you of what you can have, no matter what economic level you have to live on. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Why? Why is that so? Because Because we came into this world empty of material things to start with. And when we leave this world, the only thing that you're going to take with you is what you put in your heart and in your spirit. So make sure you put a lot of good things in your heart and in your spirit so that when you leave, you can go with those good things and face the Creator. The Creator is looking at us and wondering why are you so upset about a world that doesn't know me? I told you they don't know me. But you, because you have faith and you know why you believe in Jesus Christ, you you operate on a different basis than they do. You must make sure that you see these things with the eyes of your understanding, that you see it with your eyes that uh, are internalized, that see what you are and how you relate to God. There is great value in godliness with contentment. In verse 11, he says, flee these things. What things? Well, the things that involve you in the love of the material, that would drown you in perdition and and cause you to stray from the faith in greediness for material things and, and pierce yourselves through with many sorrows and then at the end of your life you can't carry any of it with you. 
and you face God with an empty soul that does, has no good things in it and no godliness with contentment to be found. And God says, well, what were you doing? What were you doing with all your time? Worrying about the material? Worrying about politics of this world? And you, and you let them rob you of your opportunities to fill your heart with good things? I think one thing that we need to always remember, brethren, let's remember this point. If we, if we get too caught up and concerned in the political aspects of things, and, and I confess it does bother me because we see where it's going. But that's not what your life is all about. And you have to remind yourself, this is not what I'm living for. I'm not living for this country per se. I am, I'm living to try to help get as many people from this country into that, that heavenly land. But my happiness, my contentment, what I have in my heart cannot be taken away from me unless I just plan to give it away. Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to give you a peace that they'll try to drive out from you, but, but no man can take it from you. And if we don't have it, we've just given it away. But no man can reach in there and take the gospel and the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are there. They cannot order that out of your heart. They couldn't in the first century. And they can't do it now. Flee from the things that are robbing you of your spiritual contentment and godliness and happiness. Flee from those things, O oh man of God. You are a man of God, aren't you? You are a woman of God. Then flee from those things that would rob you of the great godliness with contentment that God says every Christian can have that. Every Christian without exception. Then he goes on to say in verse 11, now we're going to run away. We're going to flee from those things, but we're going to go after some things that really do matter. That really fill your heart and your life with good things like righteousness. Have you been on track? Have you been pursuing that? Have you been trying to get better and better, learning right things, doing the right thing in all circumstances? Have you been pursuing godliness? Because that's great gain. Have you been trying to fill your, your heart with great faith in Jesus Christ? Have you been filling your heart with principles like the great principle of love for your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself? Have you been pursuing those things that say, well, I can be patient or I can endure some things because I still, nobody can take these things from my heart. And, and have we been looking after ways to be gentle, to be able to take the things we, we know and try to influence other people with those things? You see, it's all about us in this spiritual kingdom trying to affect the world in a good way. So Paul's point to Timothy Timothy, the, the world you're looking at, the world around you, the Roman Empire, their governments, the corruption you see in, their, in these governments, don't look at that too long so that you get wrapped up in it and it robs you of godliness with contentment. Because if you let that rob you, then you're going to be drowned in perdition. You're going to be... You're going to stray from the faith, and you're going to be pierced through with many sorrows. Second thing that Paul writes to Timothy, and he's in a corrupt, corrupt government. I mean, he's in a world where corrupt government is a part of it. Well, the second point in verse 12 is, Timothy, you're going to have to fight. You're not going to be able to have this godliness with contentment and all that it provides you unless you fight for it. That means you're going to have to fight for some time to put it in your heart. You're going to have to fight for priorities. 
You're going to have to fight the good fight of faith. That faith is something that you believe in, something that is eternal in its value. Things are going to really mean something to your heart. You're going to have to fight for it. It's not going to be given to you on a silver platter and, you, and there it is and you don't have to do anything to have it or to keep it. You've got to do something to have it and you've got to do something to keep it. And you've got to fight for it. I may not can fight politics. I may not can fight governments, government decisions. What I can do is fight for the faith of Jesus Christ. And I can stand for it. In fighting for something, you value it. You think it's worth something. And if you don't think it's worth anything, you don't fight for it. And I'm not talking about physically fighting. I'm talking about about grabbing hold of the things that really matter the most. And that's what he says in verse 12, is fight the good fight of faith. It's a, it's a battle of the mind. It's a battle of the heart. It's a battle of the values of the heart. Lay hold on the things that are really worth something, that you can depend on. Can we depend on eternal life? I can if I fight for it. But I can lose that if I don't. I might lose a lot of things, and we might lose a lot of things in this country, brethren. We might see the day when the church cannot meet in open places like this. We might see that day. I don't know if we will or not. I'm not going to be an alarmist, but I tell you what, it's better to be prepared with what are you going to do If it happens, well, what I'm going to do if it happens is what I'm going to be doing now if it doesn't happen. I'm going to lay hold on eternal life. That's what's valuable. That's what I'm going to grasp. Because that's something you can depend on from the source from which it came. God is not fickle. He doesn't change like Governments do, like men do. God has promised things in the past, and every time He made a promise, He kept it. And if He promised us on the basis of our faithfulness to Jesus Christ that we can have eternal life, then, brethren, you better grab hold of that, even if it takes you through a world of difficulty, at least you know where you're going. Lay hold on it. There's a fight that means, a battle that's going on that means I've got to acquire strong conviction. Lay hold on it. Because you've got strong conviction that it's worth laying hold of. In fact, he goes on to say, you were called to this. You weren't called to that. You weren't called to materialism. That wasn't why he invited you to come into his spiritual kingdom. You fight for this and lay hold on this eternal life because that's what you were called to. And you have confessed the good confession. What is that confession? Well, that's what Peter confessed in Matthew chapter 16. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of God. That was the good confession we made when we entered into Christ, is I believe that absolutely is so. So I'm called to this confession, and this confession means I hold to this confession regardless of circumstance, regardless of friends, regardless of government. You have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses Are you going to let those witnesses down now and say, I'm not so sure I believe that anymore. Things are getting pretty tough. Things are looking pretty bleak. I I, I don't know if I want to stand in that position anymore. No, you confessed it because you had good reason to believe in Jesus Christ 
and you still have good reason to, and you have no good reason to abandon that. I urge you, I urge you in the sight of God, God is looking at you right now, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things, and before Jesus Christ, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, remember a while ago, that Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? Then he asked him, well, are you a king then? Jesus says, well, you, you said it. I am a king. But my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus confessed that he is the Christ. Pilate didn't understand or appreciate that truth, but it was the truth. And it still is. So keep the good confession in front of you. Because that's the confession you made when it was dependable to leave your clutches and your involvement in this world, your grip on the world, and come into Christ. That good confession must be kept foremost now. This confession even Jesus made before a temporary Roman government. But his confession has been standing ever since. And that government failed. But that confession has not fallen and will not. So we must not fail it. And we must not let the cares of this world choke out the valuable thing that we possess in Jesus Christ. So we looked at materialism. Don't love it too much. And second of all, fight for your faith. Fight the good fight of faith. And we move on to the next verses. In verse 14. That you keep this commandment without spot. What commandment? The commandment that you fight the good fight of faith that you don't get too involved in the material world. You keep this commandment of keeping the confession of Jesus Christ in front of your eyes. And you keep it without spot. That is, you're not mixing in the world, a little bit of the world, with your total commitment to Jesus Christ. Be without spot. And blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. Until that day, we've got to hang on to the one thing that matters most, brethren. Be without spot. Don't let it be said that it looks like he's got two masters. Looks like, looks like they're involving themselves in too much of the world and, and, and too little of the faith in Jesus Christ. Don't, let, don't be spotted with that kind of of reputation. Don't let that spot your life. Let it be clear where you stand and what your life is about. He goes on to say in verse 15, which he will manifest, that is Christ will appear and he will manifest in his own time. He's going to come when the time is right. He who is the blessed And the only, underscore that word, Jesus is the only potentate. What does that mean? Well, that means that he is the only absolute ruler there is. Our president is not an absolute ruler. Nebuchadnezzar, thought he was as high as you can get. Nobody is higher than me. I've got absolute power over all of this this territory. He says, no one is higher than I am. And God revealed to him through Daniel, listen, I'm going to make you get down and eat grass. And then you're going to know who's the ruler. When men think that they're as high as they get, God says, I'm going to show you you're not. You don't have power over anything. You think you do, but you don't. I've got the power. 
We need to recognize that when Pilate had the power to put Jesus to death, that was only because Jesus wanted to. Not because Pilate had more power than Jesus, but because Jesus had more power than Pilate, and he was going to that death for a reason. I'll tell you one thing that Pilate could not do. Pilate might could sentence Jesus to the cross only because Jesus wanted to go there. But Pilate could not stop Jesus from coming out of that grave. That means that Pilate does not have power over death and life. Jesus does. So when Paul writes to Timothy, and Timothy is looking at his world and is looking really, really bleak, and Paul has been in prison and he's, he's out and it looks like we're going to be captured again and it looks like, they're going to, it looks like the government is turning on us. Paul writes to Timothy, listen, godliness with contentment. That's great gain. Don't love the material things too much. Don't count on those material things. And recognize this, that governments come and go. Nations rise and fall. Only one is absolute ruler, and that's Jesus Christ. Supreme courts of men do not have authority over Jesus Christ. Supreme courts of men do not have power to invalidate the word of Jesus Christ. Every one of those judges will stand before Jesus Christ and they will bow down and they will confess, I was a fool. We need to recognize, and just as Timothy needed to recognize, that our job is to live and keep this commandment to make sure we're keeping things in focus because he is going to come when he comes and when he appears and manifests himself, we need to be ready for him. He's the only potentate. He is the king of kings. Nebuchadnezzar thought he was something, but he's going to bow before Jesus Christ. Pilate will bow. Every person on the face of this earth, will bow before him without exception. So who do we need to be concerned about? Well, I need to be more concerned about the king of kings, what he thinks. I may not control what the kings of this earth think. I may not be able to, uh, to change the direction that kingdoms of men go. I might can influence it if I, if I put enough of the gospel of Christ in my heart and share it. But I can't change the kingdoms of the earth. But I can change myself through the power of Jesus Christ. And one soul at a time, we can make a difference. Verse 16 says that he alone has immortality. What does that mean? That means he goes beyond death itself. Death is not an issue with him. Nebuchadnezzar died. And he couldn't bring himself back. Pilate died. And he couldn't bring himself back to power. We've seen presidents rise and fall, come and go, some live and die, but none of them have been able to bring themselves back. He alone has immortality. And didn't we say that? That we've got to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life? Because that's connected to Jesus, and he's in charge of that, and our governments are not. He alone 
has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. In summary then, let me just say this. This land is no better than any other land that has come and gone. We hate to see it. But this land only has temporal life and only has temporal power. We hate to see it slipping away. But that's not my whole world. Rome fell and the United States will fall or it will change. It might do like Nineveh and change for a while and come back to its senses and start, start listening to God and, and repenting of a wayward kind of, of uh, philosophy. And then it may lose its grip on it again and fall like Nineveh fell. The U.S. will fall or it will change. And it can't depend on it. All are going to answer, though, to one thing. And nobody can overrule it. John 12, 48, Jesus says, The words that I have spoken to you, that's what's going to judge you in the last day. Doesn't matter what kingdoms of the earth. So remember our three points. Don't get caught up in material things. Fight for your faith. Make sure you have it and fight to keep it and fight to spread it. And then remember who's ultimately in charge. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's not forget that. Let's go out of here understanding that and let that rule our emotions and let it rule our lives. And then let us share that with as many as we can. We're going to give an account to him one day. He invites us into his kingdom now so that we can be prepared. If you want to be a part of his kingdom, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins and rise to serve him. If you've done that and you've fallen away and you've, let, you've gotten entangled in the material things of this world and you recognize that you can't depend on that, then you need to straighten that out.